Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 10, Maitreya Vacha Virincho Pitatha Chakre Divyam Varsha Shatam Tapaha Atmanya Atmanama Vesha Yathaha Bhagavana Jaha Shashatam tapaha Atmanyatmanam avesha Yathaha bhagavan jaha Maitreya vacha Virinchi opitatha chakre Divyam Varshashatam Tapaha Atmanyatmanam Avesha Yathaha Bhagavan Jaha Maitreya Vacha The great sage Maitreya said Virinchaha Brahma Api also Tatha in that manner Chakre performed Divyam Celestial Varshashatam 
one hundred years. Tapaha penances. Atmani unto the Lord. Atmanam his own self. Avesha engaging. Yatha aha as was spoken. Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead. Ajaha, the unborn. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Translation The great learned sage Maitreya said, O Vidura, Brahma does engage himself in penances for 100 celestial heirs as advised by the Personality of Godhead and applied himself in devotional service to the Lord. Purport That Brahma engaged himself for the Personality of Godhead Narayan means that he engaged himself in the service of the Lord. That is the highest penance one can perform for any number of years. There is no retirement from such service which is eternal and ever encouraging. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Anjanishalakaya Chakshurum Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaha Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Prachavarine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpataru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyayevacha Patitana Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. My dear Lord, please guide us all as we try to understand the timeless principles for moving towards you in love and service that you have taught through the Srimad Bhagavatam to all of us. Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here with all of you in the lotus feet of their lordships in New Govardhan. <coughs> it's, it's like returning to the spiritual world here down under. It's always a great pleasure. And today we are discussing one of the most uh, fundamental themes of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, I will talk about this in three broad parts. First, I will talk about the context and then I will talk about three principles that can help us move in our journey toward enlightenment just as Brahmaji moved towards. So, the Srimad Bhagavatam is a massive book. And sometimes it's easy to get lost. Or to put it another way, okay. Or the, in the, the, the Bhagavatam has 335 chapters over its 12 cantos. And there are two ways in which one can get lost. One lost is who is speaking to whom? Sometimes, if we are hearing a wrong, long class, and the speaker is speaking, 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 we may hear a point and that point may seem interesting. But, see there is the, for comprehension, if you want to comprehend something, two things are required. We need to understand the point and we need to understand the point of the point. 
okay is speaking okay this point is being spoken what is the purpose like sometimes some speakers are very humorous and they crack a lot of jokes in the class and everybody enjoys and at the end of the class people remember the jokes and they ask okay okay what what did you enjoy i enjoyed the joke okay what was what is the lesson from it what is the point from it that i don't know so just understanding the point doesn't really help much it's like understanding one sentence in a book or a chapter okay it's good but what is the sentence doing over there so who is speaking to whom we can get lost in the shivan bhagavatam and the second thing is the point of the point we can understand the points okay this is one philosophical point in this world this is another point over here but both in terms of the conversation and the content of the conversation overall it's easy to get lost but if we keep the purpose of the bhagavatam in mind then that can help us at least to some extent see some patterns see some structure see some order in the huge expanse of the bhagavatam now what is the purpose of the bhagavatam any thoughts Tractors. why was the bhagavatam spoken attract us to krishna yes to attract us to krishna it is it is spoken originally by whom to whom yeah it's spoken by shukadev goswami to parikshit maharaj and it's spoken for the purpose of helping him do that which is most meaningful at the time of death and that most meaningful activity at the time of death is remembrance of krishna that is ante narayan smriti so now the bhagavatam is clear that enlightenment enlightenment is not just some abstract state of seeing some light or feeling some bliss enlightenment is actually remembering krishna loving krishna relishing krishna so in the bhagavatam itself in the first three verses first canto first chapter we have this progression in enlightenment that means that what is the idea of enlightenment that is itself developed in these three foundational verses the first verse is centered around dhimahi so dhimahi that is meditate and when we understand someone something great something majestic like if we are here in this is surrounded by the mountains and the forests and when we see the majesty the hugeness of the skyline of the mountains then there is a tendency oh i want to meditate so meditation is generally dhimahi this is associated with the greatness of the absolute truth of the ultimate reality but from there the bhagavatam moves by its second verse is about dharma projita kaita that all sub optimal spiritual paths are rejected and the third verse talks about pibat bhagavatam rasam pibat pibat means drink drink the rasa of the bhagavatam so this is not just meditate it is pibat is relish so we the relishing is actually much more dynamic much more involving personal emotion and heart than meditating so this is about relishing is based on the sweetness of the absolute truth so in one sense the impersonalists often do dhimahi of course the otis can also do dhimahi meditation like in the guru gayatri mantra there is the word dhimahi in it but we are not just passive meditators we are active relishers but jyo prabhu swami says we want to swim in bhakti rasamrit sindhu 
in the ocean of devotion. So that is the idea of enlightenment. Enlightenment is understanding Krishna, loving Krishna, delighting in Krishna. Tushanti cha ramanti cha. The Bhagavad Gita 10.9 says that. That is what the to delight in Krishna. Not only satisfied to shanti, oh I'm satisfied. But to Ramanti, I'm enjoying it. Like if we have some nice food, you say, I'm satisfied, it's nice food, wonderful prasad. But beyond satisfying is del- being satisfactory. Yeah, this is extraordinarily relishable. So that is the level towards enlightenment is going. And ultimately, everything in the Bhagavatam is meant to take us towards that ecstatic absorption in Krishna. Now this absorption, it's not just emotionally dynamic. That, oh, there is a lot of emotions rising in the heart. It can also be practically dynamic because we are serving the Lord in the world. So of course, for Parishat Maharaj, his service in the world had ended. And he was going to focus directly on the Lord. But, otherwise for everyone, there is this both dynamic, there is internal relishing, internal connecting with the Lord and there is outer contributing to the Lord. The Lord has a mission in this world. So, the enlightenment that is described in the Bhagavatam, it has these two options. Internally, we connect with Krishna. And externally, there is internal connection and there is external contribution. And both of these are relishable. That's why Shri Prabhupada translated bhakti not just as devotion, but devotional service. So devotion is the internal contribution, and devotion is the internal connection, and service is the external contribution. So here, in one sense, Brahmaji's journey is described. He is going inward, then to go outward. Everybody is born in ignorance. So, so with that broad theme, so the Bhagavatam's broad theme is the journey toward enlightenment. How everybody can become enlightened, ecstatically enlightened in their relationship with Krishna. And that theme is depicted through the journey toward enlightenment of the first being. The first being is Brahmaji. So he is called in this word Ajaha, unborn. The unborn, see words often have multiple meanings. There could be a literal meaning and there could be a non-literal meaning. So by context we understand which meaning is being used. So unborn, if somebody is not born, that doesn't exist only. No, that's not the point. Unborn is used in the context that where there is birth, that there is a source, there are, there are physical parents for the birth. But unborn is, he does not have any parents. So in that sense he is used as Ajaha. So that first person, how his journey toward enlightenment was, that can guide all of us. So the previous sections have described the prayers that, was, that he was bewildered. Then he just didn't know what to do. And then he heard the word of he performed austerities. And then he, he had darshan of the Lord, he offered majestic prayers to the Lord. That was the previous chapter, the prayers for creative energy. And now that is going to be manifested in the world. He's going to act and unfold the creation. So all of us in our particular role in this world, we also need creative energy. Whether it is to take care of our home, take care of our service, take care of our preaching, decorate the temple. When we are decorating the art, uh, the deities, actually there is creative energy over there. When we are making a garland, there is creative energy over there. So whatever we wish to do in this world, it involves some kind of creation. If we are giving a class, we are creating a train of thought by which a particular mission is being mission, by message is being conveyed. So creative energy that is universally needed. Everyone needs it for doing their particular responsibility. So now that Brahmaji has got that creative energy, 
he is now going to engage in the activity of creation his role was huge he had to create the whole creation we might just have to create maybe one garden maybe one our home decoration one one cooking item we are cooking there is creative energy there so our domain may be small but brahma ji's domain might be huge our domain might be small so though the domains are different the principles are the same the principles are non different and who knows depending on krishna's plan we may have a small domain of service in which to do creative energy today if krishna wants krishna can expand our domain of service now krishna is satisfied not by the size of our domain he is determined satisfied by the quality of our service how we serve within whatever role we have in the world so this is the broad context of what is going on in the shrimad bhagavatam and the brahma's journey towards enlightenment we can talk about it in three broad principles so these th- three principles are like a triangle and within that triangle is you could say contained our consciousness and its growth as our consciousness grows a consciousness expands to take in the ultimate reality to appreciate krishna that expansion of consciousness is ultimately the purpose of krishna consciousness so these three principles are actually based on bhagavad gita 434 tad vidhi pranipate paripashne na sevaya upadekshanti te gyanam gyanas tattva darshana so we'll see these principles as they are manifested in the leela of brahma ji's enlightenment and we will also discuss how they apply in our life so these three principles are humility adaptability and curiosity so these three we can say are the a hack for life now it is the age of hacks you know there is some shortcuts well there are no shortcuts in living but we can have principles which can guide us so tat vidhi pranipate na so pranipate na that in that verse is humility hmm. then upadekshanti te sevaya sevaya te so sorry tat vidhi pranipate na sevaya upadekshanti gyana am gyana sattva darsh sevaya sevaya is service so when we have a service attitude we are adaptable okay as i do it this way but let's do it this way and then curiosity is pari prashne na pari prashna asking questions so let's see how these three contribute towards everyone's journey towards enlightenment mr brahma ji himself demonstrated this is humility he is the first person and he just doesn't know okay what am i to do he is exploring exploring trying to learn he is going outward and nothing is happening but yeah he has that understanding now the word humility can have many different meanings see these three things i am presenting the way i am presenting they actually contribute towards an online ongoing journey towards enlightenment so humility basically means if you could say humility is there there are others there is more to know and there are others who know more the essence of humility is that i don't know everything there are others who know more and ultimately that other is god god knows everything is omniscient the opposite of humility is generally ego so ego it means to edge god out <laughs> so and i know everything i don't care for god i don't need god that is the idea of ego but humility is 
there are others who know more. Then if you consider adaptability, adaptability is service attitude. That is basically, I will change myself as per their guidance. So, if I am sick and I want to become healthy, the basic point is that, yeah, there are others, maybe there are trained doctors who know better about how to keep health. And then adaptability is okay. They tell me, don't eat this food, you know, do this exercise, do these things. I am ready to do that. Then be, the humility and adaptability are good. But if we want ongoing growth, then curiosity is very important. Curiosity is, I am eager to learn more. And implicit in this is the, is the understanding that I am capable of learning more. So, this will lead to ongoing. Otherwise, humility and adaptability can lead to one-time learning. Okay, I had sickness, I went to a doctor, I took some medicine, I got okay. But then, is there something I can do to improve my health on an ongoing basis? So that this doesn't recur. For that, we need curiosity. And if only one of these is there, we won't really move towards enlightenment. Any one of these is beneficial. But all three together are transformational. So this applies in every field. Suppose you know, we want to maybe improve our fitness, learn some martial arts for self-defense or whatever. So humility is, you know, maybe there are better ways if we have been threatened, if we feel we are in danger, we just want to learn to be safe, okay? Maybe there are better ways to defend myself, maybe there is something I can learn. Then we go to our martial arts teacher and we ask, okay, what do you, what do you say? Okay, this is, this is how you should learn your body, this is how you should train yourself, this is how you can make the moves. Okay, that's adaptability. And then, the curiosity is what keeps us an ongoing learner. We grow on, generally, the way, especially this, this, somebody might just learn some martial arts and that's good enough, but somebody wants to become a martial arts teacher themselves. Then curiosity is even more important. So like that, on the spiritual path, those who become enlightened, they also want to enlighten others. And that's why curiosity is very important. So Brahmaji, he had the humility that, okay, I'm, I'm existing over here and there must be someone who brought me here. And Brahmaji was born, there was complete darkness all around him. So he just didn't know where he was, why he was, who he was, nothing. So in our devoted terminology, he was spaced out. Hmm? But he was spaced out in space. <laughs> there was nothing anywhere, anything at all. He said, the vastness of space. But he had that humility. Okay. There must be something to learn. So he tried by his own means going up and down, up and down. That didn't work. They just sat down. And then he heard the word, the So, when there was the what happened is, okay, he didn't know who was speaking. But he just heard those words, like, yeah, let me apply them. Sometimes when we have no guidance, <coughs> Prabhupada would say a blind uncle is better than no uncle. So if we have some guidance, try it out. So sometimes people, when they are on a spiritual journey, they think, I want to know whether this is the best spiritual path. Well, okay, how exactly are you going to come to know that this is the best spiritual path? Rather than worrying about this is the, whether this is the best spiritual path, we focus on whether this path can make me better. When we are sick, we don't, we don't think that, okay, I need to go to the best doctor in the world. How are we going to compare all the hundred of doc doctors, thousands of millions of doctors in the world? Let's see, we go and we see whether what a doctor says makes sense or not. So, when Brahmaji is being Adaptable. So we are talking here about adaptability. So adaptable means what? It's not that. Is he did not know whether that voice that was speaking to him that was the best instruction for him. Is this the best? 
that is a often a very difficult question to answer but better question is is this making me better is this taking me to a better place so he okay there was no other guidance available let's try this out the book so when he tried it out he promoted said that when he went to america uh, he wrote in a letter to one of his well wishers sunti muraji that we are experimenting with different ways to try to attract these western people to krishna the prabhupada is a pure devotee is completely devoted to krishna but still excuse experiment does this work does this not work so we'll see what works and we'll do that more so is this making me better rather than is this working we just focus on that of course we use our intelligence but sometimes the the demand or oh, this has to be the best can can instead of motivating us can simply paralyze us so asking is this the best that this can simply lead to paralysis because how will we ever know what is the best but is this making me better this can lead us to progress progress in two ways if it is making me better keep moving forward if it is not making me better then i understand yeah maybe this is not thing for me i i mean want to something else. just like we go to a doctor we try some treatment if it doesn't work then we shift to another doctor. now then he did this tapa and uh, this austerity he did after that the lord himself came and the lord himself came the lord was so pleased brahma ji offered prayers the lord shook hands with him to express his appreciation and now brahma ji is creating so now if you see brahma he has also offered the prayers of brahma samhita and therein he is ex- expressing his adoration for the lord so brahma ji he is also speaking to narad muni and uh, that has happened in the second canto so brahma ji is enlightened but he says the lord is so great that no one can ever know him that there is always more to know and that that there is always more to know that is curiosity so it is not that in the bhakti path enlightenment when we talk about enlightenment it is it is at one level a destination but it is also a journey that goes on forever that is what shri prabhupada is saying in the purport over here now we may say how can something be both a destination and a journey like yesterday night we came late over here so we we drove we drove those and brought us here so it was we were coming that was this was the destination but if we have come to the destination then we say the journey is over but it's not that simple in bhakti see the de- with respect to the destination it is understanding that krishna is the supreme object of love so we we love different objects in this world we may love money we may love power we may love our own looks we may love uh, some life partner we may love some political leader we may love this people some sports player some musician we have so many objects of love in this world so while we are in this world we consider the object of love no this we just wander around and round in this world we exploring various objects but above us all is krishna he is the source of everyone so understanding that krishna is the supreme object of love this is enlightenment and this enlightenment is as a destination that after exploring various objects of love i have concluded that it is krishna who is to be loved so with humility if we we could track that earlier journey humility you know i t- i had this hobby i had that passion i tried that i tried that. yeah they all give some fun they all, they all they have, i had some fun with it but afterwards it just becomes stale it becomes unfulfilling it becomes disappointing 
Sometimes it's even heartbreaking. So there must be something more. There must be something higher to love. Let me explore that humility. And then we come to the saints and the sages. With them there is adaptability. Okay, they are saying that it is Krishna who is the object of love. Let me try to love Krishna. Let me try to offer my heart to Krishna through inner remembrance, through outer service. What happens thereby? Let me see. So this is enlightenment as a journey. But along with that, sorry, this is enlightenment as destination. But if we go backward, it is not just a destination, it's also a journey. Now why is it a journey? Because after we understand that Krishna is the supreme object of love, then if and as Krishna is the supreme object of love. But after that, there are three things which we keep learning. And that is what? First is how lovable Krishna is. Hmm. How attractive Krishna is. We keep learning that. We keep learning that because Krishna is unlimited. Swayam evatmanatmanam vittattvam purushottama. Arjuna says to Krishna, after hearing the chapter, Tushtami Bhavita Krishna, you alone know yourself fully. But I would like to know more about you. Therefore, bhūya kathaya truktirhi shunamato nasti me amrutam. Please speak more. Please speak more. I never am satiated. So how Krishna is lovable? That is one thing. The other thing that continues on as a journey is how I can love Krishna. We keep learning that. Okay, maybe I can do this to please Krishna. Maybe I can do that to please Krishna. And this is where the association of devotees is so stimulating. We see different devotees serving Krishna in different ways. You know, we cook some food items for Krishna and we meet some other devotees, they are cooking something different. Oh, oh it can be, this can be done this way also. We make garlands for Krishna. Oh, the garlands can be made that way also. You know, we explain the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. We hear other devotees explain. Hey, this, this can be explained on this point. Oh, that's so much to learn. How can I express my love for Krishna? And third is, how does Krishna love me? This realization also keeps going on eternally. Generally, the relationship, we are offering our love, but when the other person reciprocates, that is also very enriching, reassuring, uplifting. So for all of us, as we keep growing, we keep learning, okay? Now Krishna is reciprocating with me in this way. That reciprocation can be external in terms of the success, the appreciation, the results that we get in our service. But the reciprocation can be internal also. It can be in terms of the sense of peace, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of joy. Now, this is where I am meant to be. This is what I am meant to do. So both of these, we see these as reciprocations of Krishna. At a very advanced stage, for the great saints, Krishna may even give his direct darshan. We'll see Krishna. When Radharani cooks food for Krishna, and then Vrindavan in some ways is a traditional society. So Radharani cooks, and then Yashodama is serving Krishna. And on behalf of Radharani. So Radharani and her Sakhi are watching from the window. You know, Krishna is eating, and how, how does it go? And then the food I the rather than is cooked up, which the way serves, and Krishna eats. And Krishna makes a face. And when he makes a face, rather than his heart, it's what happened? I cooked it so carefully. And he says, what, what went wrong? So I it. And then Krishna just pushes that particular delicacy away. Next to Krishna is Madhumanga. And Madhumanga eats it. Ah, this is delicious. And he looks at Krishna, and Krishna starts laughing. And Krishna and Radharani is watching and Krishna winks at Radharani and Radharani clenches her face, he was teasing him. So, how Krishna accepts his service, her service, that how Krishna reciprocates with her service, that gives great joy to Radharani. So at a very advanced stage, 
we will be personally also seeing krishna's reciprocation but till that time that how krishna loves me we can perceive in these two ways hmm? the success that we get in our service shila prabhupad served krishna he traveled all over the world and his sir prabhupad said the success that he got it exceeded even his own expectations he said that he prayed to krishna na chao na chao prabhu na chao sumate please make me dance oh lord please make me dance and how krishna made prabhupad dance how krishna set the stage across the world for prabhupad to dance is one of the most inspiring stories in the history of the world's spirituality so that was success and prabhupad saw it as krishna's reciprocation but along with success there is also you could say more internal satisfaction it's not that everybody who serves krishna will necessarily get spectacular success but along with external success when we are serving krishna we get internal satisfaction and shri prabhupada always had that even when he was a unknown swami walking on the streets of america of new york with uh, people treating him nothing more than as a curiosity object prabhupada was still so content when people would meet him they would see that he was so happy just so happy speaking about krishna writing about krishna cooking for krishna singing about krishna now when someone loves something and when they talk about it their eyes light up their face lights up and that's how we know this person is really into this so prabhupada was like that prabhupada was satisfied and we see that that internal satisfaction was always there for prabhupada at the end of his life prabhupada had achieved extraordinary things and yet there were things which were incomplete two major things one was prabhupada worked, ext- worked extremely hard to build the jew temple and it was very close to completion shri prabhupada departed in 1977 77 november and the jew temple was inaugurated in february february uh, 78 this 3 4 months later and prabhupada could have had that longing that this is oh i want to see this temple open prabhupada had worked extremely hard to translate the shrimad bhagavatam he considered that the nine opus of his life and he was in the 10th canto which is the most important part prabhupada could have said you know i just want to live on a little more so that we complete the bhagavatam these would have been great services but when prabhupada was asked do you have any last desires prabhupada said kuch ichha nahi kuch ichha nahi i have no desire how could prabhupada have no desire he had many desires to serve krishna but he was always adaptable to krishna's will now when we are i'll conclude with this last point when we are our service to krishna is there no service to krishna it's like a relay race now in a relay race what happens is different people run different distances so there's one torch which is carried so maybe there's one runner who runs from one dis from one distance to another then another runner runs some distance and then there's some other runner might have a long distance to run mm-hmm. but each one has their particular distance to run so prabhupada knew that the parampara was like the ultimate relay race and in this parampara he had carried the torch of spiritual wisdom jnana deep like no one else proper not proud or arrogant in that sense but he had done his part it is krishna who had wanted him to run that far that much he had done it and now krishna wanted him to hand it over to someone else and he had trained his disciples he had inspired his disciples and now ready or not he was going to hand over the mass and the torch to them so prabhupada was not discontented oh i have not completed this i have not completed this so generally if somebody is in the brink of some big achievement and they are told okay now you don't do it somebody else will get he says no i will complete it but prabhupada was not like that prabhupada satisfaction was in his heart it's like say 
a baseball match is there or no, a basketball match is there and there's one player who is leading the team to victory and just when the last few scores are to be hit the coach says okay you come back let another player play let that player hit the winning shot he says this is what is i want to hit the winning shot no he says come back like in cricket the batsman is leading the team to victory and the coach says and the captain says okay you come back you know you are retired even if you're not hurt you're retired now you come out and we send another batsman say why but prabhupa was not like that krishna called him back and prabhupa left peacefully in vrindavan chanting the holy names of krishna hearing those names being chanted showing the lesson of how to depart ultimately from this world in krishna consciousness so that is also a demonstration of the ongoing journey of enlightenment so prabhupad was humble prabhupad was adaptable prabhupad was curious prabhupad was humble in the sense that he was always seeking newer and newer means he said yes he said he never said that i am the enlightener once the interviewer asked him are you the messiah prabhupad said in america he said yes so who sent you prabhupad said my guru sent me normally the christian tradition messiah is sent by god is a little bewildered i said i didn't think that he was humble he said my i should be carrying my guru's message he was adaptable he tried this tried that tried what worked he continued that and prabhupad was curious those who were with prabhupad to see that when prabhupad was in america for the first time sanya garwal she said that swami she was the person at whose house prabhupad stayed in the butler in pennsylvania she said swami was so eager to learn everything about america is how the vacuum cleaner works how the washing machine works you know how the metro works the prabhupad did not go to america to learn how the vacuum cleaner works isn't it the people's heart was filled with the vacuum and prabhupad was going to be the cleaner of krishna bhakti <laughs> <laughs> but prabhupad wanted to understand how the american mind worked how the western mind works so that he could share krishna bhakti with others so prabhupad demonstrated his ongoing principles of a spiritual enlightenment on the path of bhakti and he has given us the international society of krishna consciousness where also we can have enlightenment as a destination where we come to krishna on the street and also the journey where we keep learning more and more about krishna so i'll summarize i spoke three broad points first was brahma's enlightenment how it happened how that indicates the purpose of the bhagavatam so that we can get lost in the bhagavatam but we can we, we can get lost in who is speaking to whom and what is the point of the point but we keep in mind the bhagavatam is directing everyone towards enlightenment then we can have that clarity of what is a better understanding of what is going on and in that connection i talked about the uh, three principles that the gita talks about and the bhagavatam demonstrates which lead us towards enlightenment it was hack what are the three any one will humility, humility adaptability. adaptability and curiosity so humility is there are others who know more adaptability is i will change myself according to their wisdom and curiosity is i want to keep learning and we saw how brahma ji demonstrates and how this is also talked about in the bhagavad gita and how with these three when we have this enlightenment becomes both a destination and a journey destination where we understand that krishna is the ultimate object of love journey is that because it's a relationship three things how krishna is lovable how we can love krishna and how krishna reciprocates with us so these three things in the bhakti tradition they are called as sambandha abhideya and prayojan so these three make enlightenment an ecstatic ongoing journey thank you very much hare krishna if you have time for any one or two questions yes please um
And so when you were speaking about um, are we looking at this as the best path or is it better to look at as is this making it better? Um, perhaps when we're new to the practice or even we could be practicing sometimes and there's bewilderment or there's the noise of the mind. Um, even perhaps if we haven't got a teacher yet guiding us, like how can we know what are the symptoms of is this making me better? Um, perhaps if we're getting triggered by things that we're seeing or experiencing, how do we know that she should stick to the path and continue and keep persevering? Yeah, so how do we know that when, when we, we are getting bewildered by things we are encountering, even on our spiritual path, how do we know that we should keep going forward? Whatever we do, even if we are practicing spiritual life, we are practicing in the material world. Even if we are on a spiritual path, we are within a spiritual movement, that is in the material world. So Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita itself, in 1847-48, he talks about don't expect utopia. He says, every endeavor will be covered by fault, just as fire is covered by smoke. So, there is, if you consider even the spiritual movement, the spiritual path, where it is being practiced collectively by different people. So, normally different people come from different backgrounds, they have different motivations, not everybody has the same level of dedication, not everybody has the same level of purification. So, dedication means, I want to move ahead. Purify, purification means, where am I right now? now? Some people just come from a background where they were already pure. Some people come from a background where they are not so, not their background may not be that good. So, because of this, dedication is how much I want to move forward and purification is how far have I already come. So, these will vary among people. And because of which, naturally, there are going to be differences, sometimes even discomfort or incompatibility, distress also might be there. What we need to be saying is, am I moving forward? And within the Krishna consciousness movement, am I getting the resources to move forward? There may be many things happening and not everything is encouraging for me. Not everything is comforting for me. So, for example, if I have come in, from here. Now, am I moving upward in my spiritual journey or am I moving downward? So this should not be happening. Now, how do I know whether I am moving upward? Now, I, mean, I, I may say I am very new. Well, I don't know. Okay, we are all one sense at various degrees. But from whoever I was before, am I becoming a better human being? Am I becoming wiser? Am I becoming kinder? So broadly speaking, spiritual growth can be seen in two ways. That is, attachment to the enduring. Ultimately, the ultimate enduring thing is Krishna. Right. So we become more steady internally. We become more fixed on higher purposes. And detachment from the fleeting. So, in the world, ups and downs keep happening. So, now, but that's reversible. Today it's up, tomorrow it's down. Maybe tomorrow it's up again. Day after tomorrow it's up again. So, this is, as Krishna talks about this in reply to Arjuna's question 2.55. Many places this is mentioned, broadly speaking. But the idea is that if life's ups and downs, are they affecting me lesser? So we could say, there will always be dualities in life. Ups and downs will always be there. Now for some people, when the ups and downs happen, their mind ends up exaggerating them. When it's up, they go way, way up. They are like in the seventh heaven. And when life goes down, they just go into the darkest hell. Now this is a very unsteady state to be in. If we are practicing spirituality and if we are growing, then what will happen for us is, the life's dualities will still be there externally. But gradually, internally we will become steadier. 
So yeah, you somebody spoke hurtfully to me. Maybe ten years ago or one year ago, if somebody had spoken this to me, I would have been so disturbed. Now also I'm disturbed, but you know I'm not that disturbed. So if I find that I am becoming steadier, then that is what is happening is I am becoming detached from the fleeting. Mm-hmm. So life can have financial upheavals, relational upheavals, professional upheavals, whatever. Because uh, how much do, do I stay steady among them? That is one sign of our spiritual advancement. And the other is sometimes steadiness can only be passive. Okay, I am just staying steady. But there is also attachment to the eternal, attachment to the enduring. So our life gets a higher purpose. Our life gets a higher purpose and we become more and more inspired to keep moving on with this story. That means that my connection with Krishna, my conviction about Krishna, that is becoming stronger. So life will always have some ups and downs. But through those ups and downs, we keep moving toward Krishna because we find shelter in Krishna, we find strength in Krishna, we find satisfaction in Krishna. So if this is happening, that means we, our mind will get agitated because that's the way the world is. But say I come to a temple and participate in Kirtan, I come to a temple and pray to Krishna and I find my mind just becomes calmer. So what is happening by that is that I am getting more strongly connected with Krishna. So the two things, when people, when something bad happens, my agitation itself is not that much. That's one thing. That indicates that I'm becoming detached from the fleeting. The second is, even if there's added agitation, I take shelter of Krishna and I feel calmer. So overall, sometimes people say, I chant and be happy. But if there are so many problems, I don't feel very happy. Well, there is happiness as a emotion and happiness as a state. State means what? You could say more like a level. So we'll find that, okay, maybe on a moment to moment I'm not necessarily happy. But overall, I am happier than what I was before. That my overall emotional well-being, my overall inner state is more in harmony. I'm more at peace with myself. Because I am getting something internal. So, if these two things are happening, detachment from the fleeting, uh, that means steadiness amongst life's dualities, and we experience a greater sense of shelter in Krishna and a stronger sense of purpose toward Krishna, this is what I should be doing. Then definitely we are growing, no matter what is happening around us. Okay. So, thank you very much. Grantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Gaur Prabhupada.